Well, good morning, brothers and sisters. Could I, uh, could I begin with a little digression to say uh, Susan and I have never been to Manitoulin before. Uh, we have been very pleased to be here. Uh, I think looking around the room, we hadn't met very many of you before, just a handful. Um, I'd shaken hands with Brother Daniel in England, and that was about it. And a few of you I've met at Bible schools here. Uh, so it was lovely to come, and we go home, uh, having made lots of new friends. And thank you for the warmth of your welcome and the kindness of your uh, uh, hospitality. We've appreciated being with you. And this, uh, this final Friday is a nice touch, 17 degrees and cloudy. That makes me feel right at home. That's, uh, <laughs> that's the height of... That's the height of supper, summer for a, a man from England, so thank you very much. Uh, we're going to finish uh, our, our week together, brothers and sisters, by just uh, 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 drawing some final thoughts from this wonderful prophet, Jeremiah. Uh, we've largely finished uh, his life story now, um, but I just want to make sure we've appreciated um, his personality, his character, his type of the Lord Jesus Christ because he is helping to bring us to our, our saviour and it might just help us uh, appreciate how we should be responding in times of difficulty and in times of good as we await for that great day when Israel is restored and they have the Lord Jesus Christ, this righteous branch reigning over them whilst sitting on the throne of his father David. Uh, he means, his name means, whom Yahweh has appointed. Uh, and here was a man specifically appointed for the time uh, to do this particular work. Uh, and, and brothers and sisters, we are, we are the same, you know. I know it might not be quite so dramatic and it might not be quite so emphatic, uh, but the Lord is calling out a people for his name and he is calling you and me and has placed us in a particular part of society or a particular location or a particular place in our community uh, and maybe he has some work for you to do and there are moments when we feel we could be better used somewhere else or we might prefer to be somewhere else or we could be doing something different and yet maybe the Lord has just put us here for this moment, for this work uh, and perhaps as we go back to our ecclesias, we'll have opportunity to think, well, I wonder what it is the Lord has in mind for me. I wonder what the Lord is calling me to do here. Um, and if I know what that call is, uh, am I doing it faithfully? Am I doing it as he would want me to do it? Uh, or, or am I kind of bristling a little bit and feeling uncomfortable and a bit dissatisfied that these are the circumstances uh, in which we have been called? Uh, we looked very briefly at those middle chapters, didn't we, in, uh, uh, in this prophecy, 30 to 33. Uh, uh, but, but it gives an insight there, doesn't it, in the centre of the book as to what Jeremiah had in mind. I know he was receiving that under inspiration. Uh, I'm sure it meant something to him, uh, 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 as we'll see. He wasn't just a man who was mechanically writing down text and passing it on. He was a man who was having to live through the inspired word that was given to him. It really meant something to him. This was part of his life. And similarly, the hope and the prospect that lay ahead was something that was very real. So even in times of greatest distress, he could just lift his eyes a bit and see beyond the difficulties and the hardship. Um, even in those bleakest of moments when he's down in some, uh, uh, some uh, um, muddy dungeon pit that was almost certainly a place of death, he would not give up hope. He was looking beyond uh, to something that lay ahead. Uh, and of course, uh, in those middle chapters, we get a very clear sense, uh, and in this little section of verses that Brother Peter has read for us, we've got a very clear impression that Jeremiah could see his saviour. He, he could see the branch, the one who would be called, the one who would be the Lord's righteousness uh, to come and to reign, uh, which is marvellous really, isn't it? Uh, I don't know that we always give credit to these Old Testament faithful uh, individuals about how much they could see the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I, I, I like to think it was more than we give them credit for. When Moses was making his decision, he was, he was esteeming the riches of Christ to be greater than anything that Egypt could be, uh, could be offered, uh, anything Egypt could offer to him. Uh, Jeremiah too, in all these difficulties, he could see um, his saviour clearly. He was looking for a new king 
priest who would bring salvation to his people. Uh, and in the words that we read in Jeremiah, um, uh, we can see that this wasn't just a return in 70 years' time. Uh, this was something that was far greater. Uh, we've made a mention, haven't we, in our, in our um, uh, classes this week, uh, of the impact that Daniel and Ezekiel and others were having uh, in Babylon. Uh, we observed, didn't we, that when Mataniah came to the throne, it was Nebuchadnezzar who converted his name, uh, who changed his name to Zedekiah, the righteousness of Yahweh, which we found quite peculiar for a Gentile king. Come with me to Ezekiel chapter 17, please, would you? Just one or two other little insights about uh, possibly Daniel's work, possibly Ezekiel's work, possibly the work of other faithful men as they influenced the higher echelons of Babylon. Um, Ezekiel 17, and reading at verse 11, uh, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Say now to the rebellious house, Know ye not what these things mean? Tell them, behold, the king of Babylon is come to Jerusalem and hath taken the king thereof and the princes thereof and led them with him to Babylon and hath taken of the king's seed and made a covenant with him and hath taken an oath of him. He hath also taken the mighty of the land that the kingdom might be base and it might not lift itself up. So, so here is uh, um, a picture in the prophecy of Nebuchadnezzar bringing the nation of Judah into subjection, uh, and it's telling us very clearly that the king is taken in verse 13, and an oath is being made. Uh, and we can imagine what that oath is. The oath is one of loyalty and allegiance. You are now my subject nation. You are now in subjection to me, and you will serve me as king of Babylon. Uh, and that's what the prophecy uh, um, is, uh, is setting out for us there. If you just come back to the historical record, though, in Second Chronicles 36, when this actually occurs, Second Chronicles chapter 36, And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord his God, and humbled not himself before Jeremiah the prophet, speaking from the mouth of the Lord. And he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who made him swear by God. But he stiffened his neck and hardened his heart from turning unto the Lord God of Israel. Um, uh, it's interesting there, isn't it? It might be an oath of allegiance in, in Ezekiel, but there's just a little hint there in Chronicles that that oath is going to be sworn by Almighty God. That was the benchmark which Nebuchadnezzar um, uh, wanted to um, um, uh, make this oath uh, with Zedekiah, uh, and it could be um, uh, some inference in there of a, uh, an allegiance to God as well. Swear by God um, that you will be a nation that will behave in this way. Uh, so um, we, we, we've, we've alluded to the conversion of Nebuchadnezzar uh, through the work of Daniel, um, but little things like that. Jeremiah must have felt so alone at times, looking around him. He was not surrounded by faithful men and women who were supporting him in his cause. Uh, invariably, he was surrounded by individuals who were only seeking his harm and his hurt. And, and there might be times when your particular road of discipleship seems a rather lonely one. There's only me doing this, there's only me trying to plough this particular furrow, and that might be true, but all around you there could be lots of other individuals who you don't know about, who are also trying to follow their lone furrow uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, that, that, that's, that's why our fellowship is such a lovely thing, isn't it, when we can come together and uh, particularly break bread and wine together uh, and remind ourselves that this is a together thing, 
Uh, we're not on our own here uh, in our discipleship, but we are doing this together. Um, and, and maybe there were just little highlights through Jeremiah's life. ebed Nelek would be one, wouldn't he? Uh, where he comes across this faithful Gentile and is able to promise ebed Nelek uh, reward as accordingly. That, that little things like that would have helped Jeremiah uh, in his particular discipleship. Let's have a look at these verses in Jeremiah 23 then, please, brothers and sisters, while we just um, capture this idea of Jeremiah looking forward to uh, the king to come. Uh, verses 1 and 2 of Jeremiah 23. Will be unto the pastors, revised version and other versions say shepherds, that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the shepherds that feed my people. Ye have scattered my flock, driven them away, and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit you, visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. Uh, this is the, the position that the nation had found it in, and it was not helped by these uh, unworthy princes who were ruling over the flock of Israel. Um, they were shepherds, they were in positions of responsibility, and instead of caring for the flock, they were abusing the flock. Uh, and and uh, the Almighty, through his prophet, was saying, this must stop. Um, and you can get a sense of that uh, in, in the way the people were being treated. Uh, we won't look at it, but if you went back to 2 Kings 23, when Egypt came up and the land of Judah was in subjection, tribute had to be paid to Pharaoh. It's in verse 35. Uh, and where did they raise the money? I can tell you, they, the princes didn't put their hands in their pockets. They didn't give of their own personal wealth to pay the tribute. They just taxed the common people. It's in verse 35. They went out and they collected the money from the ordinary man in the street rather than pay themselves. So they were happy to abuse the flock who they should be caring for. Um, and this is not good. Uh, we know that uh, that's what Jehoiakim did. Um, and certainly Zedekiah was uh, 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 not a man of strength who was able to stop any of that kind of activity. So in verse 3, God is planning to regather his flock and he's planning to appoint new shepherds who will rule over them. Uh, verse 3, I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them and will bring them again to their folds. They shall be fruitful and increased and I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them and they shall fear no more nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. All the things that the shepherds should have provided, the Lord is now saying, these shepherds have just abused the flock and they ought to be caring for the flock. It's a very interesting little prophecy in Zechariah, and I wonder if I can just take you to chapter 11, please, um, just while we, we pick up this idea uh, of the flock being abused. Um, re re remember, this is, uh, this is a prophecy which comes after the uh, exile, a time of the exile, and uh, <clears throat> we come across here just the same position. Rulers, shepherds, who should have been caring for the flock and are actually mistreating the flock and are not um, doing anything other than line their own pockets. Uh, so if you look, for example, in verse 3 of Zechariah 11, uh, there is a voice of the howling of the shepherds for their glorious spoil, a voice of the roaring of young lions, for the pride of Jordan is spoiled. Thus saith the Lord my God, feed the flock of the slaughter. And what that phrase is indicating is that uh, these shepherds should be feeding the flock instead of slaughtering the flock. But they were abusing the flock so that it was now a flock that was being slaughtered and not being cared for. And of course, when anyone accused the shepherds of abuse of the flock, um, well, they, they respond, don't they? Um, Whose possessors, verse 5, slay them and hold themselves not guilty. And they say, well, we didn't do it. They were doing it, but they, they say they didn't. And of course, the evidence for them being not guilty is the fact that they are rich. 
They that sell them say, Blessed be the Lord, for I am rich, and their own shepherds pity them not. Um, and, and, and they couldn't, they couldn't think that they were, they were guilty of anything like this, because actually they were wealthy, and therefore they were being blessed by the Lord, so they must be doing the right things, they must be behaving properly, um, and the, the Almighty is furious in the way they are abusing his flock. So, um, in the end, verse 6, he will have no more pity. In verse 7, I will feed the flock that's being slaughtered, says the Almighty. If these shepherds that, I, that I've appointed will not do it, I will appoint a shepherd, and I will feed, and it, I will make sure that this is done properly. Uh, and you can carry on down, and you know where this prophecy goes, because eventually it takes us uh, to this, uh, this great shepherd who does this work for the people. Um, and in, uh, in verse 12... Um, this new shepherd who has arrived and has united and has treated the flock well, he gives the flock an opportunity to respond and say, thanks for that. And the flock have an opportunity to express their appreciation. And what the shepherd says, if you think I've done a good job here, if you think I have done well, compared to all those shepherds who've abused you, Give me my price. Pay me my wages. Give me what you think I'm due. And of course they, they make assessments and they calculate and they come up with 30 pieces of silver, don't they? Uh, which is well worth working through scripture because um, that was the minimum amount that had to be paid. The minimum amount that had to be paid uh, when a slave was killed by a wayward ox. I think it's Exodus 24. And the people here had got opportunity to pay lots and lots if they wanted, but they thought they could get away with the 30 pieces of silver, and that was the amount. And Judas the same, it's there in Matthew 27, isn't it? You know, he comes up with 30 pieces of silver. That might have been a down payment, of course. Um, but, but, but it's an interesting little, little thought, isn't it, that when the flock has been abused, and the Almighty intervenes by sending a new shepherd who will treat the flock fairly, you'd think the flock would be really appreciative. But they actually respond by just paying the minimum amount. Uh, and I'm looking out at all of you, and I'm looking at me now, because the Lord Jesus Christ has come and cared and provided and given and made available everything that we possibly need. And there's a moment now for us to show our appreciation. Uh, and the temptation is to think that, well, we give lots back. But the reality might be that we just give the minimum. Yeah. We held him as one who was despised, and we esteemed him not. We didn't give more than we should. So, so, so in all these things, brothers and sisters, particularly with the life of Jeremiah, it's easy to kind of stand on the sidelines and look in and we can see that Jeremiah had it really tough, and we can see that the flock, the people, uh, were really bad, and the kings were really bad, and they deserved to go into captivity. This whole scripture is saying to us, you just insert yourself. And we tend to insert ourselves as a, as a Jeremiah, someone who's persecuted and hard done by. We don't insert ourselves as a wayward people. We don't insert ourselves in the text uh, uh, and think of individuals who need to repent and turn back to God and, and make sure that we have our priorities right. We don't always think in that way, do we? So maybe in our reading of Jeremiah and the prophets and our assessment of the people of Israel, we ought to just uh, uh, reassess and say, well, where do I belong in this? Am I in need of personal reform? Am I in need of some change, rather than just being critical here of these people. Uh, back in Jeremiah 23, um, Jeremiah, we've already mentioned, could see beyond the present difficulty. This is, this is what's going to keep him going. This can be the only thing that would keep him going. Therefore, um, sorry, verse 5. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, 
and Israel shall dwell safely. And this shall, uh, and this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. So Je Jeremiah, under inspiration, is receiving this, but 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 he must know something more as a consequence of this. And this cannot be just a regathering in 70 years' time, because this is a calling again, isn't it, of Judah uh, and of Israel. Not just the, uh, the people who go into captivity under Babylon, but this is a real regathering, isn't it? And there's going to be a dwelling safely where the Lord reigns and the individual who sits on the throne will be operating under this title, the Lord our righteousness. Uh, and Jeremiah is able to look beyond that. Uh, and the final two verses uh, talk about this prosperity and this regathering. So God's going to raise up a seed. This isn't going to be um, a, a Nebuchadnezzar or any other Gentile king. Um, the word raise there is quite interesting. If you look at it in the Septuagint, it's, uh, it's about raising from the dead. There's a, there's a sense of that behind it. So, so this is a, a particular uh, raising up which is going on here um, and he would be righteous in a way that Zedekiah and other kings have not been uh, and he's going to be called the branch uh, and there's lots of language that you know through the Old Testament in Isaiah 4 and Isaiah 11 and Isaiah 61 uh, uh, all those cross references that you can chase and connect this together this root out of the stem of Jesse and he will rule wondrously, uh, verse 6. And all this is happening when um, uh, Israel and Judah uh, are regathered. Looking ahead to the kingdom, to that promise of the kingdom, um, is the thing that will keep us going. I know it's a, it's a simple thing to say, brothers and sisters, and we, we, we repeat it often, don't we? We're trying to seek first the kingdom of God. Uh, but that will be our main stay. That will be the thing that will keep us going. Whatever your challenge today, whatever your difficulty tomorrow, um, that's only temporary. That is only passing. That is only a short-term thing. Lift your eyes and look beyond, and there's eternity stretching out with this most marvellous blessing for all those who can see it. Um, that's how Jeremiah operated. That's certainly how the Lord Jesus Christ operated. We know that who for the joy that was set before him could endure the cross. Can I just show you one other little reference in John 13, please? Um, and there are plenty of these. When you're reading the Gospel records, um, look out for the occasions where Jesus is not bogged down in the difficulty of the day, but has lifted his sights to something else. And it comes ever so many times. Uh, here's a really nice one. John chapter 13. Uh, you will know through the, uh, through the record of John, we have this, this repetition, um, his hour had not yet come. It, it was not the time because his hour was not yet come. And we get that several times through the Gospel of John. Uh, and if I ask you now, what was the hour that was coming? Um, Almost certainly you will have in mind, well, it was the hour of his arrest and trial and crucifixion and death. That was the hour that was coming, uh, and that might be right. But look in 13 verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father... You see, that was the way Jesus looked on the hour. He wasn't looking, it on, uh, looking on it as the hour of his difficulty where he would be cruelly treated and, uh, uh, and beaten and crucified. He was looking on it on the hour on which he would depart to the Father. Yeah, he was seeing the, the, the positive side of it. That's, that's what it would lead to. Um, and, and so too for us, brothers and sisters, in all these things, let's not be burdened by the challenge of the moment, but let's lift our eyes and say, this is taking us to the kingdom. This is the road to the kingdom. And look at the glory and the prospect that lies ahead. That's such a lovely, positive thing for us, isn't it? When we think of Jeremiah as a prophecy for the Lord Jesus Christ, um, Matthew in particular comes out particularly strongly. Always look at the, the cross-references there. 
Um, we have Rachel weeping for her children in Matthew chapter 2, which is a quote out of Jeremiah 31. Uh, we have the reference to him coming from Nazareth, uh, which, uh, which again is this uh, link to Nazir, the branch. Um, and in Matthew chapter 3, when we first meet the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and he speaks in that gospel, uh, what does he say? He says to John the Baptist, we're going to do this to fulfill all righteousness. This man who is going to be the Lord, our righteousness. He's saying, this is where it starts, John. We need to get baptized. Now, I need to get baptized. I need to illustrate my commitment onto the, the task of death which lies ahead so that all righteousness can be fulfilled and the individual who is to be known as the Lord our righteousness uh, will sit upon the throne. Um, let's do a little bit of Bible work if, you'll, uh, if, if you feel like uh, turning a few references, brothers and sisters. Um, it's, it's appropriate, I think, that we, that we just pick up some of these uh, similarities uh, between the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and Jeremiah the prophet. And, and there are very many of them. Uh, some of them we have looked at. Uh, just to be clear, uh, Jeremiah witnessed for 40 years. We've talked about that, haven't we? 18 years in Josiah's reign, 11 years in Jehoiakim's reign, 11 years in Zedekiah's time. All adds up to 40 years. And he's saying 40 years for 40 years, the temple is going to be destroyed. It was there in, in chapter 7 of Jeremiah. Let's just uh, remind ourselves of that. Jeremiah chapter 7, um, at verse 4. Trust ye not in lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. For if you truly amend your ways and your doings, if you truly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if you oppress not the stranger and the fatherless and the widow and shed not innocent blood in this place, neither walk after other gods to hurt them, then will I cause you to dwell in this place. But if you don't do that, then the consequence is, uh, is the opposite, isn't it? Uh, and this was Jeremiah's message of the temple being destroyed. So for 40 years, he's warning about a destruction of the temple. And that's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ was doing, wasn't it? He was predicting the destruction of the temple. Um, Matthew 24, let's just uh, uh, keep a finger in Jeremiah. Let's just remind ourselves of the New Testament occasion. Matthew 24, verse 1, Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and disciples came, for, uh, came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus saith unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. A very dramatic prophecy uh, when they were showing him the wonders of uh, Herod's temple as it had been built at the time. And 40 years later... In AD 70, of course, uh, that great destruction took place. Uh, we, we, we mentioned briefly, it's not on the screen uh, this morning, but we mentioned briefly yesterday, uh, didn't we, about uh, the temporary uh, lifting of the siege of Jerusalem in the days of Jeremiah, when Egypt came up and uh, in chapter 38 the, the, the siege was temporarily lifted. That's exactly what was going to happen, of course, in AD 70, wasn't it? And, and maybe the, the Bible um, knowledgeable individuals of Christ's day, you know, not only would they be able to uh, hear his words about not returning to the city when you see Jerusalem encompassed by armies. Don't bother going back into the city. Um, maybe they could pick up on the real life example in Jeremiah's time when the siege was temporarily broken. Opportunity for individuals to uh, flee if they wanted. Uh, and same in AD 70. So all these things have a lot of parallels. Um, we remember in Jeremiah chapter 11, let's have a look in Jeremiah chapter 11, that uh, Jeremiah's message was to go throughout the land. In verse 6, the Lord said unto me, proclaim all these words in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, saying, hear ye the words of this covenant. So there was Jeremiah with his instruction to travel around the whole province of Judah and witness to the cities uh, and uh, uh, then return to Jerusalem and witness in the streets there. Um, I've put a reference there of Luke chapter 10 verse 1. Of course there are plenty of examples where 
the Lord was going out and witnessing. I think that occasion is where he sent out the, uh, the 70 in pairs to, uh, to go into all cities and he would then follow uh, in order that he could preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. Uh, the, uh, the message of repentance was clear. Um, if you turn to me, you shall find rest for your souls. Um, same kind of idea in Jeremiah chapter 6, verse uh, 16. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths wherein is the good way and walk therein and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. Um, uh, if only the Lord was standing before us and saying, I've got a way that leads to rest. I've got a, a, a way that's straightforward. Uh, a way that I walk that is going to be easy in terms of burdens. Why don't you walk that way? Well, well, why would anyone say, actually, I prefer this road over here. Why would anyone do that, brothers and sisters? Uh, and yet, how many times do we wake each morning and decide to go down this road instead of that particular road? Uh, and of course, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, Matthew eleven twenty nine. Take my yoke upon you. My burden is easy. My way is light. Why don't you try that? Um, uh, love the little uh, similar message which the Lord is offering there. Uh, Jeremiah 11, again, we, we picked up on this, didn't we? Where uh, he comes to Anathoth in verse 21 and speaks to his own brethren. Uh, and the response was, they wanted to kill him. Um, and I'm sure on uh, Tuesday, was it, uh, we had a look at John chapter 7, verses 1 to 3, where at the Feast of Tabernacles, six months before the Lord Jesus Christ was to be arrested and crucified, his brothers were saying, why don't you go to Jerusalem? Why don't you go down into Jewry, into Judea, where all your enemies are? Because they too uh, wanted to see him killed. And we get the, uh, the very extreme position in Jeremiah 12 and verses 5 and 6, uh, where it says clearly there that even the brethren, the house of thy father, um, do not believe the things he said, and uh, neither did Christ's brethren. Uh, so all these things were, were pointing towards similarities with the Lord Jesus Christ. Jeremiah 11 at verse 19, we get reference to uh, a lamb being led to the slaughter uh, such a rich type of the Lord Jesus Christ, whether you're looking in Isaiah 53 or John chapter 1 or Revelation of the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world, uh, all these types here, and uh, Jeremiah has it uh, uh, in this chapter as well. Um, in Jeremiah 19 and verse 7 and 8, just one example of the destruction of Jerusalem being spoken about. Um, Jeremiah 19, verse 7, I will make void the council of Judah, the Jerusalem in this place, and I will cause them to fall by the sword before their enemies and by the hands of them that seek them, uh, their lives and their carcasses will I give to be meat for the fowls of heaven and for the beasts of the air, and I will make this city desolate and an hissing. Everyone that passeth thereby shall be astonished and hiss because of all the plagues thereof. Um, and indeed, uh, the same kind of uh, treading down of Jerusalem in Luke chapter 21 and verse 24, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Um, we ought to remember, though, where both Jeremiah and Christ stood in this. There was, there was no gloating, there was no celebration, there was no delight in the destruction of this place. When the Lord Jesus Christ... Um, um, spoke his lament over Jerusalem. It's a, it's a very poignant bit of, uh, of insight into the feeling of the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it? He, he held this city dear. He was so desolate that they would not listen to his words. And Jeremiah was just the same. He is weeping for them uh, in chapter 13 uh, and verse 17. But if ye will not hear... Uh, my soul shall weep in secret places for your pride. Um, that, 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 that's such a level of godliness, isn't it, brothers and sisters, that, that we really struggle to attain to that. Um, if you've been out preaching, if you've been sticking with the message, if you've been tenacious in what you've said, 
and you've tried really hard and people have ignored and people have refused to respond, um, I'd probably respond by saying, well, when destruction comes or how, however that shows up, I'd probably be saying, well, I warned you or I told you so or it's your own fault you didn't listen. Uh, that, that would be my, the level of my kind of assessment here. But Jeremiah and the Lord Jesus Christ aren't like that. They desperately wanted to save these people. And they were, they were weeping over them when they couldn't get their message across. Do, do we feel like that about uh, people uh, in our company, in our, uh, uh, that we come into contact with? Are we desperate for them to be saved? Uh, if so, what are we doing to remedy that? And that's a challenge for all of us, isn't it? Jeremiah and the Lord Jesus Christ had a different, uh, uh, a different approach than ours. And then there were some very telling similarities. Um, we we won't, won't look at these. I'm sure we've looked at a lot of these. Jeremiah was scourged, chapter 20, just as the Lord Jesus Christ was. He was mocked, um, verse 7 of chapter 20. False accusations were leveled against him. Uh, just as they brought false witnesses against the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, he, Jeremiah, was brought before a ruler and threatened with death, even though he had done no wrong. Uh, you remember how Zedekiah would not protect him, as Pilate would not the Lord Jesus Christ, but he was given to the people with the instruction, do what you want with him. Uh, and chapter 38 of Jeremiah has just this picture of the trial of the Lord Jesus Christ, doesn't it? Zedekiah saying, over to you. I want nothing to do with it. You do what you want with him. And what did they do with him? They put him in a pit and he was raised out again after many days. Just so the same with the Lord Jesus Christ. Lovely symbols here and lovely parallels um, uh, of, of, of the Lord and his work. And, and, and Jeremiah, as, as we've been saying all week, might have thought he was doing a lot of this in isolation but the Lord Jesus Christ here, I wonder if he was able to take some encouragement from this. I wonder if he's able to look back and say, I can see what this servant Jeremiah went through. I can see how he suffered. I can see how he was abused. I can see the difficulties that he had to go through. And Jeremiah made it. Jeremiah did it all. And that could have been a, a, a real source of encouragement uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ, couldn't it? Um, he too could see that Jeremiah did it, so he would also stick with the task, and it could have been a source of great encouragement. Um, that, 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 that's interesting then, isn't it, brothers and sisters? When, when things are bad for us, when things are bleak for us and not going well, the first reaction is to start to feel sorry for ourselves. Uh, why is this happening to me? Why have you chosen this for me, Lord? Um, the second response is to pray about it, um, but often that prayer is, please will you remove the difficulty? Please will you remove the burden? I'd like it to be nice and easy again. Uh, that, that, that's often where we get to. Um, the Lord Jesus Christ... The, the, the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, was different to this, and Jeremiah was different to this, um, uh, and they were learning from the experiences of others. And it might just be, brothers and sisters that you are suffering something or being asked to face something because a brother or sister over here needs to see an example of how to bear it. It could just be that. Have a look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, please, would you? Second Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. It, it, it might just be, 
brothers and sisters, that you are suffering something and, and you might not be able to work out why you're having to go through it. But Corinthians is telling us here, well, it might be then because you, once you begin to experience the comfort of God, you can share that comfort with others. But this brother or sister over here might see the way you deal with that suffering and it could be a source of great encouragement and help to them. So it might not have a direct purpose in your life, but it could help someone else. So it would be less selfish of us to feel sorry when suffering comes, but more spiritual of us to think, the Lord has brought this into my life for some reason. I wonder who can be helped by it. I wonder what good can come of it. Uh, and, and that was the, the spiritual level on which people like Jeremiah and the Lord Jesus Christ uh, were operating. Um, and when we start to measure ourselves on that scale, we all feel very inadequate and very, very lowly, don't we? But that's, that's the kind of thing we should be aspiring for, rather than just feeling sorry and hard done by, that life isn't as good for us as we'd like it to be. Um, let's just think that the Lord has got some purpose. And the purpose might not necessarily be with us. It could be with others. Uh, there are lots of other quotes of the prophet Jeremiah, of course, in the New Testament. Uh, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord, from 1 Corinthians uh, 1, uh, comes from Jeremiah chapter 9. Um, the, the, the great theme of Jeremiah, which is the... Uh, uh, um, uh, the downfall of Jerusalem, which then ultimately will lead to the downfall of Babylon. Um, uh, Jeremiah prophesies at the end of his uh, prophecy, of course, the downfall of different nations, including the downfall of Babylon. Uh, well, that's exactly what's going to happen, isn't it? Um, uh, this great invasion from the north, this great taking over as the city is taken into captivity, then the uh, intervention of the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints, uh, and the downfall of Babylon and all her uh, associates. That's the picture, and Jeremiah's got there first. Um, and then this great promise that your names are written in heaven, uh, that we have in Luke chapter 10 and uh, contrasted with Luke chapter 8, uh, John chapter 8, where the Lord Jesus was writing names possibly in the earth. That comes from Jeremiah chapter 17. So there's lots of, uh, lots of um, uh, links here with the Lord Jesus Christ and lots of lessons uh, that are pointing forward uh, for us to take away. So we've worked our way uh, carefully. Um, but rather superficially, I have to confess, and, uh, and you will know that uh, through the life of Jeremiah, uh, but there might just be something there which helps us to, to go away and, uh, and look again at the text and try and appreciate what was happening uh, in the life of this particular man. Um, he was a man who was devoted completely to the Word of God. Even when delivery was difficult, and he might not have wanted to, uh, uh, to do the task. He stuck with it. Um, he was a man who had the vision. He invested in his inheritance, knowing that one day he would be able to uh, collect it. He knew that fields will one day again be bought and sold. And he has his uh, uh, title deed ready for his plot in the promised land. Um, he was resolute. Um, he prepared, he got going, he delivered the message, and if ever he was dismayed, he just pressed on, he just hung on. Um, uh, and I'm sure his life would be one of encouragement to the Lord Jesus Christ. But we, we, which means then, brothers and sisters, um, we, we've completed that little study, and we now um, we go away from here. And it can either be a book which uh, we've read and we've kind of looked at and we might have learnt one or two things or it can be something which is going to make a difference for us. We can either go away and we can be downcast about our lives, our families, our ecclesial situation, whatever it is, or we can go back and be encouraged. Um, Perhaps as much as any of you, if not more so than many of you, I'm privileged to travel around our community um, and you come across little pockets where we're a bit down because numbers are shrinking and we're not holding on to the truth in the way that we used to and this isn't being done quite as we, ought to, as we think it ought to have been and, oh, my grandfather would have been horrified if he could see this. You know, you get that little thing. 
And then some, some places you go, and the truth is just alive and bursting, and young people are keen on their scriptures, and they're wanting to be involved, and ecclesias are training and witnessing and caring, uh, and, and really good examples of, of, of Christ-like following and service are going on. Um, if ever you hear of uh, negative comments and uh, you know where the truth's about to die out and all that sort of doom-mongering that you would get, don't feel that. Trust me, there are really good things happening our com in our community around the world that the truth is burning strongly. It really is as we await the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now is a time for shoring that up. Now is a time for, for holding on to that. The Lord could be back at any moment and we'll soon all be engaged in a much greater work, which will be fantastic, won't it? So, um, if there is anything to take from Jeremiah, um, it's this looking to the vision that lies ahead. It's preparing ourselves for the work. It's not to be downcast, but to lift up our heads for our redemption draweth nigh. Thank you.